You know, I've missed your sparkling personality. Oh, dear me. I'm terribly sorry. The fourth generation Kirio. Does she dance on the sand? Is she like that river twisting through a dusty land? Should you care? Why, let's find out, shall we? Kia! Gaja! Here we are with anchors tying us to what we're Call home even if the sight of it has not yet touched our eyes And here we are and we're together Even if we are apart and we're together and when we're together Something big is happening amongst So welcome to the first episode of Tweed Jackie Reviews for 2021 Today we're in Hampshire and uh, driving this 2017 Kia Rio 1 litre TGDI 3. This has been very kindly lent to us by um, a friend of mine, Caro. So thanks Caro, Farrow. Before we get into more detail about the Kia Rio, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so, to like this video and to leave a comment below. It really helps us to uh, rank higher on YouTube and to be able to spread the love of tweed jackets all over the internet. So the Kia Rio has been around since the turn of the millennium. It's a model that's now over 20 years old and this is the fourth generation car known as the YB series. This isn't the same Kia Rio as you can buy in Russia and China. Uh, it's, it's a European market car, although it is sold in other, in other places like the United States of America, and uh, it's one of Kia's most popular models globally. With this three trim, we have all sorts of exciting things like lane keeping assistance, we have climate control, multi stage heated seats, a heated steering wheel, a heated front windscreen, automatic lights, automatic wipers, faux leather upholstery, a reversing camera. It's also a very, very comfortable place to be. I'm actually just uh, on my way to uh, meet Mr. Bill uh, from Walls Wheels, who is going to be helping with some of the filming today. And the ride is actually really compliant. It does help that um, you know I'm on a motorway in a 50 mile an hour contraflow section, but uh, you know, by the way. We actually have covered the Kia Rio before on uh, this channel. We had a 2015 uh, Mark III model on sets of second-hand reviews. That uh, wasn't a very good episode, I'm afraid. It was the first one, so please do let me off if you now decide to go off and uh, watch that. But uh, do so watch this one first. The engines available in the YB Kia Rio in this country are the same 1.25 litre engine that's also in that 2015 Rio that I drove. Hyundai also unit, it's uh, from the Kappa series of engines that uh, Hyundai and Kia make and it develops 84 horsepower. There was also, until quite recently, a 1.4 version of um, that same engine that developed 98 horsepower and for a while was the only Rio you could get available with an automatic gearbox. The ones that I would probably recommend to you if you can afford them though are the 1 litre TDGI units. Three cylinders with either 99 or 118 horsepower. This is the uh, 99 brake horsepower version and it's mated to a 5 speed manual gearbox. Later models uh, such as uh, you know post facelift ones that um, have just come out quite recently, about six months ago, have a six-speed manual gearbox with a 99 brake horsepower engine. You can also get an automatic on um, some of the one litres now, but if you want the ultimate experience, and uh, this was only available with the um, first edition of the launch in early 2017, you want to go through the 118 brake horsepower version of that engine. That is also available with uh, an automatic, and uh, yeah, you get a six-speed in that from, from the start. 
there were also uh, some diesels available but as usual we don't talk about diesels on this channel so trim levels available in a YB key rear with Mark 4 like this were one, two, three, and first edition at launch. That's since changed a little bit. You still get one, two, three, but uh, it's now GT Line and GT Line S at the top. There was also a Pulse Special Edition uh, that was somewhere in the middle, I think. But uh, yes, overall, nice range of trims and a very nice car. This particular car. 99 brake horsepower engine does not to 60 in 10.5 seconds. Average fuel economy, uh, well, I've actually got an instant readout here in front of me. We're doing 50 miles an hour in fifth gear uh, just through this contralow section, and for some bizarre reason, <laughs> the instant miles per gallon readout maxes out at 50 miles per gallon. So if I'm doing more than that, it just stops. and. Uh, that's a little bit weird, I don't know why it does that, but yes, uh, the official figures say something like between 48 and 52, it depends on the year because sometimes we're using the old NEDC readings, um, but um, now obviously we use uh, WRTP standards for most new cars. The steering in, in the car feels pretty nice, we'll go up to some country roads in a little while and uh, see if it's actually any good through the bends but uh, in terms of a companion for motorway cruising it's it's really really good the seat is very comfortable we have reach and rake adjustment to the steering wheel um, it's very easy to get a good driving position visibility is not great through the back but that's probably why in this three trim there are parking sensors and a reversing camera but it, yeah it feels very well planted and uh, we're just about to come into a 70 mile hour section so I'll just drop a gear and we'll do some acceleration. We got a little three cylinder thrumming away there. That feels good. It's not quite as fast as the old set Toyota I had but then it's lacking about 11 horsepower on that car. Uh, maybe if you want the uh, sportiness you can go for the 118 brake horse a power engine um, and uh, maybe with a six speed manual. So here we are on the country roads just south of Winchester. The surface isn't great so maybe the camera's shaking around a little bit but the steering is pretty good for a car of electric power steering. Obviously I miss the hydraulic setup of something like an MG3 but one of these it's pretty good. It doesn't quite have the same level of poise and handling as a Ford Fiesta, but it is better than actually the car that this shares a platform with, which is the second generation Hyundai i20. Let's go through this corner. There's not as much feedback through the steering as I would like, but most people really who are in the market for this kind of car won't notice anything like that. The seven year warranty that Kia supplies is, in this particular class, unrivaled. MG's is uh, close, but it only has 80,000 miles. This is 100,000. The engine is actually a chain driven unit, and so it's very unlikely to have any problems with the wet timing belt that you get in something like a Volkswagen TSI engine that was fitted to my set today. There is a bit of a question over sort of reliability on those. But this shouldn't really have any problems. Um, Kia's are very reliable cars. Let's um, park up then and uh, examine this car in more detail. Tying us to what we're Call home even if the sight Of it has not yet touched our eyes But here we are Do you know, despite a lot of contemporary reviews 
telling me that this car doesn't drive very well. I actually think it does. It's particularly good on the motorway, but it's not out of its depth on a country road. Anyway, let's uh, now look at the Kia Rio's more practical side and take a look at the boot. Oh, not again! Once you've got the key out so it doesn't make an annoying noise, um, if you walk around to the back of the car, one of the things that you can be aware of, if you look at one of these, part next to say, I don't know, a uh, Kia Schumer that was on sale about 20 years ago, is that this is about the same size as one of those. It's quite a large car for the size. And if we open up the boot, notice on this three model we have a standard reversing camera, is that there's 325 litres of space. That's actually very, very big. There are cars that are slightly big. I think the Volkswagen Polo at the moment is about 330. Um, but the annoying thing is, if we lift up the boot carpet, you'll see we don't have a space saver spare wheel. We don't have anything other than a can of tyre foam and a compressor. And as I found out the other day when I had a puncture on another car with a can of tyre foam and a compressor, that's really not going to help you. So uh, I recommend the optional space of a spare wheel. Why it's an option, I don't know, but uh, anyway, we won't talk about that too much. The load lip is quite high. It's standard for most cars of this class, really. And if we were to fold the seats down, we'd find we don't like it pretty flat either. If you look inside, we've got a couple of hooks here. Um, we've got the car's manual, which is pretty big, actually. It fits in there, too. Uh, there's a light here. The only thing I can't find is a 12-volt socket, which is uh, pretty annoying. I think that would be quite handy these days for a car like this. One thing Kia have done, though, is they've put handles either side of the boot. So if you want to shut it and you're not particularly tall, then you can do that. Obviously, I don't quite need that most of the time. But, yes, it's a... Pretty good boot for this type of car. For this type of car, there's actually a fair amount of leg and headroom. I'm five foot eleven, and my head's not touching the roof. Um, this is roughly where a passenger would normally sit, and I've got more leg room than usual. One thing I can demonstrate is the fact that this side of the car has a mat pocket and this side does not. That's a bit mean really, but uh, never mind. Also, this faux leather interior on this three model, it doesn't feel as nice as I'd expect really. Uh, if you want faux leather to be done properly, uh, buy yourself uh, an MG ZS or something like that. Anyway, you can fold the rear seats down. I'd recommend you put the seat well, buckle into this special hole here, which doesn't seem to work very well. We'll just leave that for a second. Just pull back down. You see, it's very easy to fold the seats, but um, we do risk that seat by getting trapped because that thing doesn't need to work very well. No rear armrest in this car, unfortunately, but what is a sign of the 2010s when this car was made is the fact we've got a USB port right down there. Wonderful. Stepping into the front of the car is not as easy as it would be in something like, I don't know, uh, Skoda Karot we filmed back in December, but it's not too bad. One thing I can do straight away in this car, once I've turned the infotainment system on, is connect my phone to Android Auto. There's also Apple CarPlay available. Drone position in this car is actually really, really good. It's got rake and reach adjustment for the steering. The seat goes up and down in all sorts of different ways. I prefer to have it down in this particular car. Headroom, of course, is extremely good, which is, which is brilliant. One thing I would say, though, is the side is really let down by these hard plastic door cards. There's lots of space for throwing things in, like, you know, the new microphone I've now got for recording channel videos, but there's no fabric or anything, and this is very hard wearing, I've no doubt. We're not going to have any problems with trim falling off. This is a Kia, after all. But it seems a bit mean in this almost top-of-the-range model to not have any fabric in here at all. Now, with the first edition, which was a car available at the launch of this one, there were some coloured accents for the dashboard and also the doors, I believe. But it, it does feel very dark in here. And, um, you know, we feel for the 
soft touch materials and they're only on this um, centre bit of a dashboard, which is a bit of a shame. However, we are surrounded by all sorts of luxuries. We have a front heated windscreen. We have multi-stage heated seats. We have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. We have satellite navigation. We have lane keeping assistance. We have Bluetooth. We have the most number of steering wheel controls I've ever seen in my life. And this steering wheel is also heated. We have automatic lights, automatic wipers, uh, faux leather upholstery, which feels a little bit more weird than I would expect. And of course, thankfully, a nice conventional handbrake. Of course, the most important test of an interior is whether or not the secret mission documents will fit in the glove box. Let's see if they do. Oh dear, that's no good, is it? Never mind, they do fit in the door pocket. So if I switch the car on and it makes nasty bongs at me, just make sure we've got radio on zero for copyright reasons. So if we go on here, we've actually got Android Auto already connected and I can just press that button there and it goes onto the home screen of, of my phone. I mean, this isn't a particularly good Android phone, but it serves a purpose. Um, if we unplug this, we can actually use um, the satellite navigation, which comes up on here. We can have it bigger than that if we want. And it, it's a pretty easy system to use. It, it's not um, the most modern graphics in the world. But this car does date from 2017. But uh, nice 7-inch display on this particular car. The newer models, and bear in mind this car has just been facelifted uh, about six months ago. They have an 8-inch display in the comparable trims. We've also got, of course, um, radio. I do believe we have DAB radio, yes we do. And uh, media with a bit of Bluetooth and an aux in. You can connect a phone via USB, of course, or anything else you feel like doing. So we've got two USB ports for this car, also one in the back, and then a 12 volt socket down here. On this three trim we have um, Climate control as well, it's only single zone, but that's not really a problem for sort of buyer who would be able to getting this. You also have power folding mirrors, which will, there we go, it just folded for me like that. Although, one thing I've noticed, if you lock the car, it doesn't fold the mirrors in for you. Hmm, it's a bit annoying that. Anyway, uh, plenty of places to put secret mission documents in the door. Uh, two cup holders down here, and in there we've got uh, a nice cubby for losing things in. The one thing I do feel though is this car feels quite low for some reason and if we switch the car on so we can look at the reversing camera, you do get parking sensors and a reversing camera on this, on this trim, it doesn't feel the highest definition and uh, the lines look like they've been drawn by Microsoft Paint in about 1995. Nevertheless it's good to have that camera, I do like it. and I just like the, the overall feeling of, of this cabin, just, you know, hard touch materials aside, it's a very pleasant place to be. Something worth bearing in mind is that a base model Ford Fiesta costs about £16,500. A base model Kia Rio, I, I have checked this uh, on a website this morning, is £13,500 approximately. So the Fiesta is actually more expensive and it has a shorter warranty but bear in mind I think the Kia Rear One maybe not I wouldn't recommend one of those they are quite sparsely equipped but it just makes you think about the ever-increasing costs of motoring. So I've taken out my secret mission documents again because I need to tell you about the safety features available on this car. As standard uh, we have forward collision warning, lane keeping assistance, blind collision warning, driver attention warning and rear cross traffic alert. Some available on some trims are blind spot monitoring, which this car doesn't have, I can see, um, smart cruise control, lane following assist, and intelligent speed limit warning. One of the things that you do now get with the top of the range 118 brake horsepower version of this engine after the October 2020 facelift is a mild hybrid system, a 48 volt system, uh, with what's now been renamed the Smart Stream. Um, TGDI engine which has a drive mode selector and 
also a clutch by wire system, which I don't know how that works exactly, but it sounds fascinating. So then, what do I think of the fourth generation Kia Rio? This is a very impressive car. Certainly with this pricing structure and a warranty that's available, it's very, very difficult to ignore. Sure, it's not the nicest to drive and you know some of the interior plastics could do some work, but overall, this is one of the best cars in its class. Oh, dear me, I'm so sorry. As I learned from my predecessor, Bond, I never joke about my work. Thank you for watching this episode of True Jacket Reviews. I source cars for people on a professional basis. To find out more, please visit the links in the description below. Thank you.